Hello, everybody. Uh, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulty here, uh, <laughs> so I have to apologize. Um, let's uh, give a moment to see if this is going to resolve. Well, we um, may have lost uh, our, our moderator uh, in that um, Rhonda Moore has been having some problems with her audio, and they're still trying to diagnose it. But uh, in the meantime, um, my name is Noah Falstein, and I'm going to step in as uh, emergency moderator. Uh, I'm a co-curator of the health and wellness track here uh, at Games for Change, along with uh, my colleague, Walter Greenleaf, uh, who, as far as I know, will not be joining us today. And I want to welcome in the panel. I'm going to get started. I Luckily, Rhonda has been so prepared that she gave us all uh, notes on the questions she wanted to ask and uh, the organization of this. So I'm just going to step in in her stead and uh, run things for the, the rest of the group here. And hopefully, Rhonda will be able to join us before the session is up. Uh, we'll be doing our roundtable talk for the next 50 minutes or so, and we're going to reserve some time at the end for Q&A. Um, so uh, save up your questions if you have them. Uh, and we will begin, I think, with uh, introductions of everyone. Uh, I, I'll just start quickly with myself. I've been in the games industry for many years and have been working as uh, uh, both as a freelancer doing games for health uh, for, well, the first one I worked on was uh, a game called Remission uh, back in 2001, so it's been a while. Um, and after four years at Google as their chief game designer, working on a lot of their AR and VR projects, as well as some other game-related projects, uh, I devoted myself primarily to this Games for Change and, uh, in fact, have um, worked with both uh, Elan and Matt that you, you see here and uh, have gotten to know Mariam, so I've been relatively connected through all of this. And uh, let's... Um, Let's see, I'm going to go around based on uh, the order I'm seeing on the screen. Uh, Elan, why don't you unmute and uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing. And I'm not hearing you, so this is really disturbing. Wait, can you hear us? Can you I can hear you, Mariam. Uh, Matt, do you want to try? Hello. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Boy, this is a cursed uh, uh, panel, I think, on the technology side. Um, I wonder if whatever happened to Rhonda is happening to one person in the room. No, I still can't hear you, Elon. That's odd. We see you unmuting. Boy, this is really disturbing. Um, well, in the meantime, well, let's see. Elan, why don't you keep trying? We'll let you know if we hear you. In the meantime, uh, let's go to Matt, um, and you can do an introduction of yourself, Matt. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Omernick, and I'm a, a co-founder and the chief creative officer at Achille Interactive. Um, so we are, are really a cognition company um, focused on you know, creating direct treatments that are oftentimes in the form of video games. Um, we're, we're excited to to talk about uh, last year. We actually created the first FDA approved video game in history, um, which was our pediatric ADHD product called Endeavor RX. So I, I come from a similar background as Noah, I'm working many years at Lucasfilm, Electronic Arts, DreamWorks, and um, but yeah, we started Killy almost ten years ago now. So um, got a lot of really exciting stuff underway, and I'm excited to talk about it. Great, uh, Mariam. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Noah. So Bye -bye. thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, Ilan, could we hear Ilan or not yet? OK. Um, not so, yet. So I'm Miriam Nusrit. I am the founder of Great Gaming Revolution for International Development. And basically, I come at it from, from, from a non-gamer uh, background. So unlike Noah and Matt, I have not been in the, in, I was not um, in the gaming industry for the longest time. I came at it from the education side. I've been in the ed tech industry for the past 11 years. And one of the things that I kept seeing was that video games were not being leveraged, um, you know, for 
for education, for awareness, for behavior change. And that's kind of where I came into it. I mean, of course, uh, Games for Change is testament to the fact that we've, we've all been thinking about how games can go beyond um, entertainment. But I really do think that the, the pain point that we tried to focus on was the cost of game development and reaching a global audience. So for the past seven years under um, my not-for-profit uh, studio, we've been creating low-cost mobile games to inspire positive behavior change on a global level. So we've been making games for the $20 smartphone that, that has a high penetration rate in countries like Nepal or or you know, Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's kind of where we've made games on reproductive health and COVID-19 awareness and climate action, all of which have do have a mental health, most of which have, have that mental health under scoring and, and stream. And right now we're working on something really exciting, Noah, if I can take a minute of, um, we're launching uh, Breshna, which is a no-code platform that allows people to make their own purposeful video games without any coding or design skills. So really very simple Super Mario kind of video games that you can make um, on Breshna. So that's me and, um, and we can start our chit chat, I guess, no. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh, it's, this is a little scary. I keep waiting for, you know, one of the rest of us to drop out now. Or, it's like that zombie movie. Where <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The, the tech zombies. Well, let me say, uh, actually, just because it's down to the three of us, I'll, I'll also mention, um, uh, Mariam, you might be getting some. Um, Hello. You know, let's see. What, oh, we can hear you. Excellent. That's good. Awesome. We're moving okay, in the right great. direction. Um, uh, let me just finish to say, uh, Mariam, uh, last week I um, addressed a hackathon of a group of, um, uh, I think it was 400 uh, pharmacist students and, and recent graduates. They're, they're doing a world congress now. And one of the questions that was asked, are there any platforms made for doing serious games without having to do coding? So I sent some people your way and you may be hearing that. But I just bring this up because uh, it's not specifically mental health, of course, but it was really exciting for me to be contacted by this group. I, I guess there's a, uh, uh, I think it's called the IPSF, um, uh, which is a group of about half a million pharmacy students and um, recent pharmacy student graduates, uh, now full pharmacists, and they get together once a year. This has been the, the oldest professional organization of its kind. And they chose to do a game hackathon, even though hardly anyone had game experience. Uh, they're using Roblox as their platform, which is an interesting choice for, for serious games. So at any rate, it's uh, exciting to see that uh, the, the rest of the medical world is catching on to this. And with that, Elan, if you can introduce yourself and say a little bit about your work, and also if you can angle your, your camera down a little bit, you're looking a little low on the screen. There you go. Fantastic, thanks Noah. Uh, so my name is Dr. Elan Schneider. I'm a physical therapist, and I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called Train Pain. And we're developing novel digital therapeutics for people who are living with really complex chronic pain, and in particular, neuropathic pain and fibromyalgia. Uh, and so these are patients who have a lot of hypersensitivity, things like gentle touch or slight movement cause severe pain. Uh, and we developed a therapeutic using video games uh, that are using haptic video games, actually. So the patients are wearing uh, tactile stimulators uh, and they're doing sensory desensitization exercises through video games. So normally in a video game, you know, you make decisions based on colors and sounds. In our games, you make you make decisions based on what you feel in your body. And so we're actually training how they're noticing their body, how they're paying attention to their body, how they're processing sensory stimuli. Uh, and we're trying to improve um, the function of inhibitory circuits, the circuits that turn the volume down on sensory uh, perception. Great. Well, let me roll over into our, our list of questions here. Um, so just uh, starting from where Rhonda had uh, suggested, she wanted to talk about our, our work in serious games. We've already touched on that, I think, with introductions. Uh, so maybe if each of you, um, and uh, I'll start this time with, with Mariam, could tell us a little bit about um, how games actually uh, work in the um, projects you do, because 
one of the things, of course, is that we each use games in slightly different ways in our, our serious applications. So how that fits in, and particularly if it ties into to mental health, as uh, I believe we all do on one way or another. So Mariam, why don't you kick it off? Yeah, absolutely. So Noah, um, most of the, the audience that we work with are, are non-gamers um, and often, you know, it's like, uh, again, like I said, the low and middle income countries. So I'll give you an example. For instance, um, we created a game um, in Nepal on reproductive health with the Georgetown University. And the whole idea was um, perceptions and attitudes. And this is where it, it does link in with with mental health and, and social attitudes and social norms, because as you can imagine, reproductive health and specifically menstrual health can be something that's that has a big social stigma and a big social taboo. And we approached it by saying, hey, uh, let's t let's use the video game as a conversation starter and also as a low cost intervention. So if you think about it, the Georgetown University, um, the counterfactual without our intervention was that they would go and show up to these in-person workshops in the rural areas and then they would get like 20 women in the same room and then they would be really awkward about i mean they really didn't want to talk about reproductive health or did, did not want to share their social issues and none of the men would attend these workshops and and we just took it to that idea of saying here's a game just play the video game and and really know one of the things we really tried to focus on was context vigilance so the whole game i mean the relatability for the game really comes from the characters and the backgrounds and the context that you see and that is really where the power of video games comes into play so the storytelling it was based out of nepal it had a goat that would drive you through the journey of you know giving you information about fertility awareness or menstrual health awareness and then every time you got scoring you could buy shoes for the goat and you could buy dresses and clothes for the goat and all of that stuff but i really do think that the idea was to uh, demystify debunk some of the myths and and really hit at social attitudes and social norms within that so that's just one example of some of the work we've done but now we're working on a game on structural racism and as you can again imagine um a really really heavy topic i mean that that's that's hard to have a conversation around and often the the organizations we work with our partners they treat these video games as conversation starters and also to attract people who otherwise would not have been part of the conversation. So those two things are really power powerful to me as video games. That's great. And uh, I, I am willing to bet that uh, you may have the only game about dressing a goat for um, mental health. And I qualify it because there probably are other uh, you know, goat dressing games that people are working on, but maybe not in this particular area. Um, so let's see, uh, Elan, why don't we, we go to you now? For yeah, sure, so, so we're you know, addressing a population that's really stigmatized. So these are patients that you know, are living with pain for a long time. And a lot of these patients, the doctors can't find a cause for their pain. And so they tell them, you know, you're crazy, you're making it up, you know, you're exaggerating. And so a lot of these patients are kind of outside of the healthcare system. Uh, some of the ones that we've been targeting, they're at home, uh, highly disabled. And so um, kind of intervening both on this actual sensory therapy side, but also validating what they're going through, you know, is a real thing. And that's a lot of the feedback we've gotten is that, you know, we have this invisible illness and it means so much to us that people are actually trying to, to help us uh, with this problem. Um, and then also, you know, beyond kind of the very neuroscience aspects of sensory perception, just changing body image and body perception. Many of these um, people that we're working with have a very negative association with their body. The body's let them down. The body's been a source of suffering. And so to play a game where you're using body sensations and you're paying attention to your body. Oh, Rhonda's here. <laughs> oh boy, she's here. Bye-bye, thank you. Hi everyone, sorry about that. Real, like, could not log in, it was just terrible. Um, so, you know, I wanna, um, Thank everybody for coming and I want to, you know, figure out where you all are in the conversation. Um, I just sort of blindly jump in. Um, so sorry about the tech difficulties today. Uh, we've Terrible. been carrying on. We're delighted to see you back, Rhonda. Uh, we're um, getting so some, some feedback, though, um, <laughs> from, I think, uh, because of the audio you're using. Um, so I guess, yeah, if you can mute yourself when you're not 
um, talking that would help. Um, and I, I've been taking over the duties and you know following your list and we're actually going around working on question number one and uh, uh, Maryam and uh, Ilan have been in the midst of that. Ilan is finishing up and uh, then it'll be Matt's turn and then we can let you take over from there and uh, also do a, a full introduction of yourself, please. I will let you. Okay. Well, I'm. I'm. Maybe I'll it's not. Sorry. Go ahead, Rhonda. Now we're not hearing you again. I'm sorry. Oh, geez. Maybe we continue with Elon and then come back. I think so. We're so sure. sorry, Rhonda. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm <laughs> sorry about that, Elon. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to think. Um, so, so just in terms of like uh, really trying to give people a positive experience of their body. So playing a game, you know, with your body sensations, winning a game, you know, experiencing rewards. Uh, and learning that the body is not just, you know, you can experience the body in a positive way as well. It's not just a source of suffering, but it can even be a source of, of fun. Uh, and so that's kind of the angle we've been taking it with the games. Great. Uh, Matt, why don't you jump in? Yeah, thanks, Noah. Um, yes, at Achille, um, our, our flagship product, which I mentioned earlier, Endeavor RX, is uh, specifically for pediatric ADHD. The company's pipeline goes much deeper into cognition. You know, we have we have completed studies and trials underway in lots of different areas, including um, anxiety, depression, traumatic brain injury. Um, we actually have two COVID fog studies that we're kicking off uh, right now as well with Vanderbilt and Cornell, which we're very excited about. Um, but it, to to address the question, I think uh, it's easiest to talk about Endeavor RX and the the pediatric game specifically. Um, our, our treatments are direct treatments, I think, which is something that's a little um, different and nuanced, I guess, in, in prescription digital therapeutics, at least for Achilles. So what we're really doing is enacting physiological change in the brain, changing the neural network of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, to help these kids. I can't hear anyone else. pretty intense um it feels so oh can you guys hear me okay? we're we're losing you a little bit high. matt it looks like your your bandwidth issue is coming up um maybe turn okay. your video off sure i'll try that but we we're okay. basically maybe that's a little bit better. yeah that should be better we're following you so go ahead okay great apologies apologies for that um so i was i was mentioning um because our uh, treatments are direct treatments, um, changing the brain directly. Uh, they're pretty intense. And so our games, the diet, specifically pediatric, pediatric ADHD, um, is we put a lot of production value into our games. Um, so they really look and feel and act like really high quality uh, consumer video games with really deep reward systems and long tooth reward loops um, and just high, high production in the quality of the art. And a lot of this was because we um, we really need to push these children and challenge them when they're in there. And as I mentioned, it can be really intense. And in order to do that, you have to match that intensity and that challenge with reward. Um, as we all know from developing games, that is the sweet spot. Um, a game that's too easy, nobody wants to play it. A game that's too hard, no one wants to play it. But if you get that sweet spot where the challenge and the reward are beautifully balanced, that's when you get magic. So we're trying to lean into that with our products into that kind of phenomenon um, because these need to be tough. They need to be intense when you when you experience them. So yeah. So I, when I uh, try and describe what uh, you're doing at Achilles, one of the things that I use to to you know explain that is that uh, it's almost directly analogous to physical exercise, and that if you aren't feeling a little sore by the end of the day, you're probably not making progress, or certainly not making quick progress. And um, you know, in a in a mental sense, I just I find the uh, Endeavor game to be um, 
really rigorous and you just have to push yourself, you know, as hard as I push myself in video games. Although the, the feeling of course is exactly like, you know, a, a really good arcade game when, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm having to engage all my senses at once. So, um, you know, hats off to you guys. Um, Okay, uh, Rhonda is asking me to continue moderating because she's she can't hear the session. So I will go on with this. And um, my apologies, Rhonda. Uh, I hope you can at least join in and, and listen in on what we're doing at some point. So um, pulling again on Rhonda's notes here. Uh, Wait, can. <laughs> Did you <laughs> did you just do that? You <laughs> just did that on purpose. Yeah. I wish I did. Uh, <laughs> so you can hear me now? Yeah, now we can. Okay. It was a moment where it was just like <laughs> it was. Yeah, this is. There's definitely this is this is actually kind of spooky. You know, it's uh, that was my my Bluetooth headphones deciding for no reason to cut up and then cut back in again. Um, Okay, so at any rate, um, we're talking about uh, COVID-19 opportunities. Um, and uh, let's see, I guess I'm having to keep track of who I'm starting with each time. I think I'll, I'll start with uh, you, Ilan. Um, are there any changes? I know that you've had some certainly in the way that you're conducting your testing. Maybe you can talk about how COVID-19 has affected the process and if your uh, treatment is doing anything along those lines. Yeah, sure. So um, we intended that the treatment should be used at home. We, you know, we're targeting a population that's already, you know, needs care at home. So the COVID situation in that sense is not a new uh, paradigm for our therapy. It's just kind of how we intended it. Um, but the clinical trials did involve patients coming into the clinic, especially for the, you know, the, the baseline measurements. So we had to transition everything to uh, remote trials. So that's been an interesting process. It seems to be working uh, quite well. Um, but what I think is most interesting is really from the other side, which is the doctors and the health systems, they're much more open now uh, to these types of solutions. And so, um, you know, we were already designing for this kind of scenario, but they weren't really ready for it in many ways. Uh, and now I think there's just been this evolution and change in awareness and, and willingness and uh, prioritizing these kinds of solutions. So that's an exciting opportunity because we really do hope to be working within the healthcare system. Uh, so. Yeah, that's one opportunity that's opened up. Okay, um, and Matt, you've already told us a little bit about um, the, the brain fog work. Do you want to delve a little more into that or, or tell us about uh, any other ways that COVID-19 is impacting uh, the company? Sure, um, I mean, I think I can start with kind of kind of the, obvi the obvious, which we've all touched on a bit, right, is in that is, is a very, um, dramatically different experience that the world just went through. And I think the idea of what can be remote, what can be de delivered digitally, right, has shifted for almost everyone. Um, and I think uh, everyone is extremely open-minded now to, to things that can be done in a different way and using technology in ways that we haven't thought of in the past. So in a, a weird way, I think that has been good for the world. Um, and so prescription, remote digital therapeutics that can be distributed and accessible around the world um, down to sub-Saharan Africa. These are, this is a wonderful time to be able to do that and to be able to reach these individuals. So um, it's kind of stating the obvious there, but I think it is really important. Um, that being said, uh, specifically on our, our products and the opportunity that we see to, to help here um, with some of the mental health issues that are coming out of the tail end of this is um, our, our different products that, that we call engines internally, so not to be confused with game engines like Unreal or uh, Unity. Internally at Achille, we call engines the, the set of algorithms that are you know, mechanistically changing the different parts of the brain and strengthening these different areas. What's really interesting for us, and this is, again, me, I'm not a, not a neuroscientist, uh, but I've been learning a lot. Uh, there's, there's tremendous overlap in many of these different areas, uh, tension specifically. Um, so one of our engines is very squarely uh, aimed we're laser focused on improving intention. And that is an issue across multiple populations. Um, so that's not just an ADHD thing. There are um, issues, particularly COVID fog that we're seeing in some of the, uh, the long haulers that are coming through, the reporting of their list of 20 symptoms, the third, the third on the list seems to be cognitive decline and working memory issues and attention issues. And so um, 
So I know our scientists and, and the others that we're working with at Vanderbilt and Cornell are really excited to see if we can apply that technology to help there as well. Um, so part of our business is to be able to spin up clinical trials relatively quickly, do them remotely when we need to, and to be able to generate a lot of data quickly, both in clinical trials and in the real world. Um, so we're trying to do that across many of these populations, learn about them quickly and be able to help as soon as we can. Okay, uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, Maria? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think Noah, um, you know, like Matt was saying, COVID-19 really did level the playing field. It was just like the whole world was stuck dealing with the same exact issue. And, and I think remote learning, remote entertainment, remote education, everything came to the spotlight. And for us, um, it was really that pivotal moment to just democratize both how video games are made, but then also how they're used, right? So, I mean, for us, it was really this idea of saying, especially if you think about mental health and if you think about storytelling, whose story is it to tell? I mean, who will make these games and what is the story we're trying to tell? And for the longest time in video games, players are seen as consumers and 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 we like we we give them solutions and we say, hey, use this. And could it be that they're empowered as content creators? And one of the things that we saw, especially during COVID, was over the last two years, but really, really rapidly in 2020 was the no code movement. So no code happened, right, with Zapier and Bubble and all of these apps. And it happened with the entertainment industry, but it did not trickle down into the purposeful video games industry. So that's kind of that was the birth for us for Breshna. I mean, obviously, it's a small, small start. It's very simple video games, but it's saying this is your story to tell, whether it's healthcare workers, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's content, everyone can be a content creator, whether you're a farmer or a mother or a teacher or, you know, I mean, whatever your profile is. So that rapid democratization of video games and saying, you can leverage the power to tell your own story was really the pivotal mo mo movement for us. And then uh, absolutely this idea that at first, video games or, or any remote intervention was seen as a nice to have, but not a must have. And um, in, a, in a separate um, life on, on a separate hat I wear is at the World Bank, uh, where I've been working across 22 different countries for education policy. And often technology or, or you know, interventions like these were like, oh, okay, maybe we'll think about it. And now all of a sudden, the governments were coming to us asking what to do about it. So I think the appetite is fresh right now for solutions like these could not have been a better time. It's a small, small silver lining in this very big tragedy that we're coming out of. Um, and I think that it's it's policymakers are looking at these things differently. And I think it's an it's a unique opportunity where all the actors have finally aligned and are speaking the language that we often speak at this festival for the past decade. So so I think that that's been that's been a big shift for us. Great. Well, I'll, I'll also throw in something, uh, not so much for myself, but uh, for Dr. Emma Lundberg, who I, I worked with uh, briefly about a year ago, and that she has done some citizen science games. I believe she's actually spoken at previous Games for Change and um, contacted me because it turns out that uh, people who get COVID-19 end up with a specific type of lesion on their lungs that looks something like what you see from pneumonia, but not quite. And as a consequence, she was trying to um, put together a serious game so that people could uh, look at, we were looking at both x-rays and MRIs to uh, try and see if we could um, reliably tell the difference between these two different types of uh, you know, shadows on the, the imaging. And uh, unfortunately, as what often happens, uh, didn't get funding. And it was one of those things where it was a time-based thing, because in order to build this, there was a sense that we might not be able to finish it until uh, COVID was, was in our rearview mirror. And sadly, as we're seeing now, that may end up being quite a while, and particularly being able to diagnose those uh, long-term um, damage to, to people's lungs, not to mention you know, other parts of their body. Uh, it's something that I'm I'm hoping uh, some people will will find ways to to follow up with her project. Uh, she's she's a uh, Swedish researcher who is out um, as a visiting professor at Stanford when I met her. Um, just wanted to throw that in there. And now let's see. I'm going to move on to our our next uh, question here. Um, so this one is. Uh, 
Uh, okay, that's part of the COVID-19 question. Um, so despite the great unmet need in mental health services, and um, given what you've discussed, uh, uh, how can games help address inequities in mental health, uh, healthcare delivery and services? And how have you created uh, solutions? Um, and I think uh, this is meant to be part of the um, Oh, and she's actually, this is in the context of the digital divide as well. And, uh, you know, how it's um, difficult to, to, you know, have some people have access and, uh, you know, a, a range of different problems. Rhonda, are you audio? I'm, Do we have audio? I'm praying that I'm here now. So three devices it's later, I'm here. Sounding like it's working. And this is great because I'm actually having a little trouble with uh, the, the question on your list here. You know, if you want to, to rephrase, I don't know if you just heard what I was saying, but I'm uh, working on the, the part where you're talking about the digital divide as um, I think uh, barriers um, at the bottom of the second page of your, your notes there. Is it possible for you to jump in and interpret what that question was? It is, so just a second, sorry. Okay, and, and uh, I want to, to uh, thank Rhonda for her valiant efforts here. This really seems like we've got some kind of magical sprite interfering with our audio. It seems to be hitting uh, everybody one way or another, um, so. I don't know, thank you. Um, so one of the questions, which question are you on? I'm sorry. Uh, I, th I think we are on um 2b is the uh thing the and and or, sorry and 2c um um so you know i i guess one question and thank you all everyone so much for your patience with all of this uh, sort of my tech issues um and collaborative tech issues um but i guess one of the um bigger challenges and thank you Noah, for moderating what do you see as some of the major challenges or barriers um, in the development of deployment and certainly use of um, of digital um, of digital mental health games. Um, and one big area, you know, um, was sort of looking at the digital divide, what we learned post COVID, and if I had been able to talk more in general about what I was gonna say to set the context, um, one of the bigger challenges, certainly in low resource settings and in LMICs is, um, as we found under COVID, is that there is a huge digital divide. There's a gender digital divide, but that plays a role in who is able to access services um, and connectivity and access, um, which we found out today certainly plays a role, but it plays a role in certainly um, whether or not we can design interventions or gather data to improve um, mental health interventions uh, through mental through improve mental health through interventions. So I guess one question that I would pose to the panel is, you know, how in your work are you um, beginning to think about addressing this um, issue? Um, and also, um, how do you um, see the design of devices having to be transformed? so that we can address a broader range of users um, and consumers um, who may be vulnerable and at high risk. And I'll, pu I'll put it over to you. I'll start with Miriam, if uh, that works. Sure, absolutely. Great to have you back. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience um, um, as, we, as we deal with the audio zombie here. Um, but yeah, I think Rhonda really, uh, for us, this is at the core of our DNA, right? I mean, if you think about the video games industry, the focus has been on, on the higher end of technology and the technology spectrum of saying, hey, we have VR and AR and we have all this cool stuff happening at the high end of technology, but it's almost a huge lost opportunity because there's a very high level of penetration of the $20 smartphones. And unfortunately, mobile games, especially mobile games, are not being made for them. And if you think about the opportunity, so an average person spends a year of their life waiting. OK, you're, you're just spending a year of your life waiting in the at the DMV office, on the metro, at the dentist's office, for waiting for stuff to happen. That wait time is so much longer when you're talking about the developing countries. I come from Pakistan, and you have to wait for everything. And that is where people are on their phones, right? And that is where you can catch them. So there's no need to take them away from their daily lives. It's not that you're asking 
uh, a farmer to stop farming and then play these video games it's really that they are on their phones and that's that's exactly the opportunity to catch them and i feel like ronda making video games that are compatible with a low end phone that can work offline that has is a small video game does not take up a lot of space on these smaller phones and i know that that does there is a trade off in in production quality there right i mean and and, that, and that, that's it but the counterfactual is really a brochure i mean they're not able to play call of duty right so but, but the but the video games that they're playing um actually unfortunately there's not a lot of games being built for these low end phones especially not serious games and the counterfactual is a brochure so still what you're ending up making and creating is very engaging very interactive and i think this idea that entertainment is only for those that that may be well off i mean that's that's slightly tragic and entertainment is immensely important in everyone's life and we can really leverage serious games so for me i think the digital divide is on the uh, it bonus is on us because the the devices are there it's on us to be able to make video games that are compatible with these devices thanks so much mariam so um matt i mean in your work um i know that you know you've been doing some incredible work with akili but um, you also mentioned more recently, at least to me, and I think it was published, um, work on sort of COVID-related fog. And since COVID, a pandemic touches all aspects of every population, can you tell us a little more about those efforts to expand access, um, certainly inclusiveness, um, and create more targeted and precise treatments? Absolutely. Um, and we did talk, chat about it a, a little bit, I think, right before you we were able to jump on as well. Um, but um, specifically related to that, the question of the digital divide and equity, um, something we've been talking about a lot at Achille, um, especially this year, has been, um, there's obviously a lot of talk about you know, equitable access, right? When you were talking about vaccines and digital formats. Um, we've been pushing ourselves to think about equitable benefit is the term that we've used to the point that this has become a corporate goal that we've, we've set up to, to set out to develop metrics to measure what that means. Um, but really taking about that, that next step, it would be great and will be great when we can make these things as accessible as possible to, to everyone. Um, and you know everything Mariam just said, I couldn't agree more. That's great getting the access, but are people benefiting equitably from the actual treatments is another question if you really think about it. So we don't have the answer today, but it's something that we're spending a lot of, of cycles and energy on trying to figure out what those metrics might be, how important that is. We think that's great for, for, for us, for, for the, our patients, but we think well beyond that um, to try to kind of push everyone to be thinking about it at that level. Uh, so something we're very excited about. Um, you know, um, Elon, I would love to, you know, just sort of hear more about your work. You know, you've talked, um, we've talked pretty much offline about, you know, the role of stories in terms of your intervention, but also um, how is this sort of um, expanding sort of the landscape of treatments, but also improving measurement because you're hearing more about different aspects of the patient experience? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I don't think we've um, solved it, but it, we've definitely highlighted the issue um, because, you know, in a lot of the trials, the, especially with something like pain or, you know, other, um, you know, depression, anxiety, these are things that are very hard to express on, you know, zero to 10 scales. You know, when we ask people, you know, how much pain they have, you know, it's like a 40, I have a 40 out of 10, you know, so it's, it's very difficult to express. And, you know, what we found is that when we had the opportunity to really talk to the people who are playing our game, um, the feedback they gave us was so much richer, you know, talking about, you know, um, just these kind of very difficult to describe uh, feelings about their body and disassociative experiences, how connected they feel to their body, how much they feel like their body is the enemy versus the friend. Um, you know, those kinds of things are very difficult um, to describe. So while we can, we can quantify sensory perception, you know, through our app, we can actually see how someone's sensory perception is changing over time. Uh, we can also collect measures like, you know, the zero to 10 scales and classic psychosocial scores like pain catastrophizing and pain related anxiety and depression, but we still haven't found a really good way to capture those much richer um, experiences uh, that, and, you know, I hope it's something that we'll be able to do a better job at. I wish it was something that, you know, the FDA, the regulatory process, the insurance companies, uh, I wish that that was something that they cared more about. They don't. 
Um, so, you know, there's not a lot of incentive to, to build those. Um, and I'm just, just saying for my, my company in, in general, um, there's a very narrow way that, that, um, that these conditions are, you know, um, monitored. Uh, so I, I would like to see some more expansion in that area. Uh, and I also just wanted to mention just about the issue of equality and equality of access. Um, we also, you know, haven't solved that problem, uh, but some of the ways that we've tried to target it is, you know, making, making the product available on iOS and Android, um, thinking right away from the beginning about localization and languages and how we can minimize text in, in, the, in the game so that it's easy to localize. Um, we've tested it in several countries, uh, several different cultures, uh, trying to get as wide as possible in terms of, of gender and race and, and socioeconomics. Um, but, you know, still um, there are certain essential things. People need a phone, people do need internet. Um, we did transition from VR to mobile only. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was to try to make it more accessible and scalable, but there's plenty more work to be done there. Um, Noah, um, I'd love if you could weigh in on this particular issue and also thinking also about maybe um, what does the team look like based on your experience um, and how can we um, sort of expand certainly um, the effectiveness of games um, for the, in the mental health space, but also how do you make it a bit more affordable based on your experience? Yeah, well, and, and as my last, you know, uh, emergency moderator thing, I'll mention that uh, I think after I'm done, we need to shift to Q and A because we're we're down to the last ten minutes or so. Um, and and we, if people want to start putting uh, any other questions, I know we already have one from Kate in the chat. Uh, we we uh, think typing them into the chat window is the best way to to share your questions. But that said, yeah, it's um, it's an interesting struggle. I guess one of the ways that I would typify it is that um, certainly, as as Mariam is saying, the the low cost Android phones are, uh, you know, the sort of largest market out there and reaching the largest number of people in the world. And if you hit Android and iOS, then you, you know, it's certainly the the easiest, well, easiest, the the uh, widest market that you can reach. But I know a lot of the um, types of interventions that that people are doing also require something else. Uh, you know, uh, Train Pain, for example, has a device that they, they ship to you. Uh, Achille runs on iPads, but only on iPads that are uh, essentially shipped by the doctors because it's a prescription service. So it has the advantages of being prescribed by doctors, but also the disadvantages of, um, you know, not only the difficulties that adds in, but uh, the fact that it, it has to be done differently in different countries, sometimes even in different parts of different countries. Uh, and some of the other people I work with are uh, committed to using virtual reality, which uh, has wonderful benefits you can't just get any other way, but requires a fairly expensive headset that's also uh, difficult uh, to sterilize. So if you're trying to share it, then that can be a problem as well. So those are just a, a handful of the kind of issues I'm seeing. Something else I think you're, you're alluding to is, I mean, it's, it's interesting. One of the things I love about Games for Change is that we see how worldwide this uh, movement is to to make games everywhere. You know, virtually every country on, on the globe, there are people uh, experimenting with and, and implementing um, video games and, and many are doing uh, games for, for health as well. Uh, but that also just brings in all these issues that uh, Ilan mentioned of, of localization, uh, cultural localization as well, and, and Marianne has, has touched on that. So I think we've, we've covered that, that range of things uh, pretty impressively. Thanks so much. And um, so, you know, I know we're getting ready to jump to the last few minutes, but, you know, briefly for all of you all, what is the future of games? What are some next steps? And um, and then we'll open it up for the Q&A. So, um, and I'll let you all go in order. So, Miriam, then Noah, um, Ilan, Matt. There we go. I mean, for me, the way I look at it, Rhonda, I think, I want I want video games to be like video, like that communication tool where you have like you you you're doing TikTok videos and you're communicating through videos. And I think video games have this immense power that we're just scrapping, like you know, I mean, the tip of the iceberg. And I think so. For me, it's video games by everyone for everyone and for all sectors, including health and mental health. That that's my vision. 
And I'll just say part of what's kept me active in the games industry for over 40 years now is the fact that it's constantly reinventing itself. And uh, that's you know even more true, I think, in this health field. And uh, I don't know where it's going. I do know that it's going in many different directions at once. And it's just exciting to, to see that. Uh, personally, I think one of the biggest, most exciting developments is going to be um, true augmented reality and uh, the likelihood that, you know, I, I, I spent a year wearing Google Glass and uh, getting taunted for it occasionally, but I expect uh, within the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing things that look just like regular sunglasses that give us these magical science fiction capabilities and uh, so many great uh, benefits for the health side because having something people are wearing on their heads like that at all times adds all sorts of interesting sensor possibilities that we can also take advantage of for, for healthcare. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, um, Elon? Yeah, sure. So I would mention two things. Uh, from the therapy side, um, I think the future is really games that are creating physiological change, like Matt was talking about. So uh, moving from behavior change, which is critical, but also looking at more expansively, can the games actually create physiological change, uh, motor, cognitive, sensory. Um, and then also, I think, um, more acceptance of the idea of a video game. When I speak to hospitals or doctors, I still sometimes leave off the video game part uh, and at the very end say, you know, by the way, it's really engaging. You know, there's a game part of it, too. Um, but um, you know, that I can actually go in and say, this is a medical video game. This is a video game um, therapeutic. So, yeah. Matt? That's great. Yeah, I, I could definitely piggyback off that comment specifically on too. I think I would personally like to see that term just vanish, just dissolve into society, right? Where, you know, the term video game or any stigma that might be, is just not there. You know, I think the reality even today is that um, these things are interactive experiences. Period. And if you look at them that way, everyone is playing games right now in one way or the other. I mean, the OS on your phone has so many of the qualities and characteristics and feedback loops that a, that a good game does. Like, so I think this is starting to melt into society in a great way to the point that um, hopefully any stigma or any um, categorization of what a video game is or is not just goes away. Um, you know, and I, I personally want my kids when they grow up to look back at medicine and the experience of medicine and just kind of laugh at us like we were doing bloodletting back you know, now, right? Like um, that we've used technology, we've used these great qualities of interactive experiences to improve um, not just the outcomes of, of patients, but the touch points that they have interacting with medicine. Um, I think so many, of, so many of, of kind of what exists and is the status quo and how we um, administer and receive uh, medicine can be helped by these. Thank you so much. I want to thank you all. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. So, um, and I'm the the plan I understand is that they're going to keep this room active, but um, shut out new people just so there's no confusion. But we can actually go over. I know many of you have, have tight schedules and need to to be elsewhere too. But um, I, at least in my case, I've got some time, and hopefully, we can stick around and answer some more questions beyond the next few minutes. And my tech's finally working, so I'm going to stick around. So, um, and I thank you all. So, I guess um, from the, um, I guess from the, I'm going back through the chat, um, and I'm seeing that, um, thank you, Noah, for um, answering some of the questions. So, I guess I'll start with Kate, um, Mu King Curtis, um, um, who asked a question of Miriam. Um, in terms of mental health applications, specifically creative tech therapies, how do you see researchers and game developers co-design, co-develop, participatory design, I guess that's um, part of that, um, with youth as they are considered true digital natives, bringing their own language, UX, and narratives? Yeah, so Rhonda, I actually did um, did type a quick reply in there. I think, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, honestly, it's really about going back to, I mean, we've done it through focus groups. We've done it through bringing youth as part of the game design element itself like i mean the actual process and then obviously with breshna we're just empowering the youth to make their own video games and tell their own story but i'd love to hear from the rest of the panel and not take up a ton of time on that well um, i mentioned just earlier the working with this this group of uh, pharmacy students and they're not exactly children but uh uh, the fact is that I think we're already seeing the digital natives and maybe even more importantly, the people growing up 
with things like um, Minecraft and Roblox and that uh, more and more you know, people as young as five years old are learning to create their own games and seeing that as a natural part of things. And uh, people have been making, I mean, I, as a kid, I made games, uh, but they were board games. And the fact that it, the tools have now made it possible for, um, you know, even five and six year olds to, to be working on video games is just uh, marvelous. And I expect we, we will be seeing the ramifications of that for many years, but we're just getting to that point where those people are getting old enough, having grown up with those sorts of tools to be able to uh, get into the workforce and, and do something uh, on their own. Um, it's, uh, however, I do wanna point out, sometimes I, I have people say, well, how could you, Noah, as, as a, uh, an older person make games for younger people or whatever? And, and frankly, I mean, I think that's part of being professional and that we all have to learn how to think as different people particularly when you're talking about games made for, uh, you know, as, as Achille does for uh, uh, pediatric uh, cases where you're, you're looking at, at, you know, nine and 10 year olds, you're not gonna depend on nine, year, nine and 10 year olds to make those games. You'll, you'll certainly consult with them and try and get some of their opinions, but uh, it's, it's just the, the reality is that um, we're all going to have to put ourselves in each other's shoes and think games are actually a really good way to do that in many, many uh, cases. So I'm hoping that we don't all have to just, uh, you know, hire a bunch of nine-year-old consultants for these, for these projects. Um, Elon? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that the, the team is really critical. And I think, you know, we tried uh, very hard to have patients, you know, part of our uh, design process to a certain extent. I mean, certainly, you know, from the first, um, brainstorming phase, you know, having patients part of the conversation. And of course, whenever possible, uh, like immediately deploying it to real people who, you know, have these conditions, whatever you can do, whatever uh, framework you can do that safely. And um, it's really important. Um, I think we, I think Matt has uh, signed off, but um, so I'm going to hop on to the next question. And what are your thoughts on the use of, thank you, Chris, for this question, Chris Leach, um, on the use of serious games or games with a purpose application for the reduction of mental health stigma? Um, I will actually um, start and answer that question. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Rhonda Moore, program officer um, in global mental health um, with, um, oh, Matt, you're coming back. Hi. Um, and, did, um, and, and I lead the Digital Global Mental Health Technology Program at NIMH um, with a focus on low and middle income countries. And so we are doing, we are, we support research around mental health stigma, um, that uh, um, whether it's um, mental health stigma in low and middle income countries or um, in um, regions with HIV globally also, whether it's low resource settings in the states or in um, in um, an LMIC or a low and middle income country. So that work, um, um, my thoughts on the use of it is definitely, and we actually support that type of research. I'll let others sort of weigh in on that. Matt, we, we lost you a bit. So um, the use of serious games or games with a purpose, an application for the reduction of mental health related stigma. If you wanna jump in or anyone else. I mean, well, one me, of the things that, oh, go ahead, Noah. No, please go ahead. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I alluded to it earlier, but, you know, one of the specific feedbacks we got, you know, in the quote from the patient was, you know, this makes me realize I'm not a lone idiot going through this. Um, you know, just knowing that there's a game, that there's other people who are playing this game too, the other people that are doing the therapy, that a team actually developed this for this uh, population uh, makes people feel less stigmatized. Uh, and particularly, it's been a challenge for us to figure out how we can integrate the social aspects of it. You know, where do you want to, you know, connect people? Where do you want to keep privacy? Um, what are people who are engaging in these kinds of therapeutic games looking for? You know, we've had some people say, we would love if we can connect to other people through the game. We've had other people say, um, we don't want, you know, during our therapy time, we don't want to be interacting with anybody else. This is just, you know, this is my time to do my therapy. So... I think there's opportunities there and also challenges in, in how to make it work for everyone. Definitely. And, and let me just add, because I've, I've worked with Elan, that uh, it, it, one of the things that they're focusing on is fibromyalgia, which some people actually still doubt is even a thing. And, you know, the people who are suffering from it are, are obviously not very happy about that. So um, I think it's, uh, 
uh, you know, it's great that that's happening. Uh, something else I'll add is that just the very fact of having a digital treatment, and as, as many of our treatments do, that they're, they're self-contained so that people can just interact with the uh, device and not have to have a person involved. Um, there's an advantage, obviously, in scaling and being able to, to reach millions of people. But also, uh, there's been some research I know done um, as Skip Rizzo uh, has talked about this at, at previous Games for Change, in that some people would actually rather not talk to a person um, because of that stigma, but feel a lot safer talking to uh, a, a digital character on their, their phone or on their computer. And uh, it's interesting seeing you know, some of the research that I've seen from that, or even just the anecdotes that people have. It's um, uh, gratifying and, and a little surprising to me that that people are so willing to kind of open up about very personal things just because they're talking to a machine and they don't feel judged. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting power we have in, in the digital world. Um, Matt, I didn't know whether or not you wanted to weigh in on that. Um, sorry, I got uh, kicked off there for a second. Um, I was actually just uh, typing in an answer to Lucia's question, so I'm not sure where we are in the conversation, but I can very quickly recap. She asked about um, ADHD in adults, and I'll just say yes, that uh, specifically our plan is leveraging the FDA clearance and the 510K process to expand um, to basically get access to everyone with ADHD, including adolescents, adults, uh, even children below the 8 to 12-year-old that we're currently labeled for. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Was there uh, another question that was fielded while I was gone there for a second? Um, you know, people were thinking about, um, uh, Chris Leach had asked a question about um, mental health stigma and sort of the use of games around, um, uh, um, to sort of m mitigate or sort of reduce some mental health stigma or other types of stigmatization. So wanted to sort of mention that um, and see if you wanted to weigh in on it. Miriam also, feel f you already weighed in, but um, Matt, wanted to just see if that was it since some. Um, um, yeah, not, not, not much to add to that uh, based on kind of what I've, I've heard. The team. I think we're all, that's all one of the meta goals that we're all trying to do here. Um, removing a lot of different stigmas, <laughs> but this is a really important one. So and someone else. Very quickly, yeah. just um, one thing on empathy that, that I mean, we, so we made a game on endometriosis, the disease, and very similarly to fibromyalgia, it's an invisible disease. And one of the things that we focused on was the support network. So not only making the, the person, the player, or the patient feel validated, but actually building that empathy amongst the support network. And that's something that really video games are able to do because, again, they build that you can you can relate to the avatar so this idea of you know it's like how much pain and i mean again this i mean the, there's there's way better experts on on pain here but i really do think that for endometriosis the idea was really to say hey it's not just a bad period it is a disease and this is how you build empathy for it and it was really um focused on a high school setting so it's 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 a younger how do how do younger girls with all the embarrassment, with all the stigma that comes with menstrual health, how do they communicate and how do they get validated, get diagnosed? It takes seven years to, to diagnose endometriosis on average, which is insane. So how do they get taken seriously and, and validated for the pain that they're feeling? Um, you know what, I, I, so I, I'm in total, I think that's wonderful, and I, I've, I've been always so inspired by your work, Miriam. Someone asked a question in bar R, I, that's what I'm seeing. Um, they said, is it just a device problem or an infrastructure level also? Like in many countries, Netflix isn't actually accessible because of internet speed, reception in certain regions. And I think that's sort of a question uh, around the digital divide. And then Ramon also mentioned many low-cost Android or smartphones. They don't support um, augmented reality games. Um, I guess in terms of like it, I think, I mean, I'll answer this given that, you know, where I sit at NIMH, um, a lot of our work is supporting um, developing a mental health infrastructure because we, we found under COVID here in the States that there, um, for certain individuals, certainly certain communities, there was less of a mental inf uh, health infrastructure. But definitely in LMICs, L um, mental health is often stigmatized, particularly uh, mental health disorders. And so it's really about supporting the development and building of that mental health infrastructure and aligning it with certainly non-digital solutions, but also 
digital solutions, which could include and often do include serious games. And so I think it's an issue of it's an infrastructure issue, certainly, but it's also a device problem. And I think the challenge is designing digital solutions that potentially can operate at a low cost that are affordable, effective, and certainly delivering interventions that are effective um, in the absence or in connectivity fragile infrastructures. And I'll just throw that out to you know Noah, certainly Mariam, because I know you have Prashna and Ilan. What are your thoughts on that? Because they've raised a good question. I mean, it's kind of maybe it's tang tangential, but um, you know, one of the issues of accessibility is how affordable these solutions are. Uh, and if it's a medical solution. It needs to go through a very expensive process to get validated and approved. And so you wind up like I know we started the venture with, you know, how can we make something that costs a few dollars that we can put out there and quickly learn like you can't do that because if you're going to be making these medical claims, you need to go through a very expensive process that costs millions and millions of dollars to get through to do pivotal trials, randomized controlled trials, uh, go through a long FDA process. And then that you know, you have to raise money to do that. And then you have to raise the cost of the solution that comes out at the end. Uh, and so I wonder what can be done to reduce the burden of getting um, certain. And I think the FDA has already started to do that. Like in COVID, you know, they, they created these special exemptions that are temporary exemptions for mental health uh, applications. And I think that's, you know, a wonderful thing. Um, but in general, even beyond COVID, what can be done to lower the bar, uh, low risk interventions um, so that they can get to market with, um, you know, less cost of development and then ultimately passing that on to the end user with more affordable solutions. You know, one of the uh, conflicts actually, uh, Walter and I talked about this at our, our session yesterday morning around this time, that one of the conflicts between the way that the games industry works and, and technology in general and the way the health industry works is just that speed issue. And for good reason, obviously, you know, if you really want to uh, show efficacy, particularly on the level of an FDA clearance, then yes, it takes millions, even tens of millions of dollars, um, not just to develop the game and do the research, but to keep the development team uh, employed for the, the months and usually years that it takes before the research results come back and you get your, your clearance. And uh, happily, there are you know, many people who, you know, some of the people on this panel among them who have found ways to, you know, sort of bootstrap their way up and do the smaller trials and use those to to get to that point. In fact, I think everyone has done that. Even companies like uh, Achilles started with, uh, you know, a very small trials, you know, based on prototypes and use that as a way to get the money to be able to fund the much larger trials. Um, it's it's not not easy, but uh, as I, I tell people in, in you know the workshops I do, that if it was easy, anyone could do it. And uh, I, I quote a, a movie in saying, you know, of course it's hard. The hard is what makes it great. Um, it's it's a bitter pill sometimes, but the fact is, uh, what we're doing is really good work that that helps a lot of people. And it is very difficult, but uh, uh, that just means that you know, we have more work to do and make it easier and more affordable and more uh, accessible to people in order to, uh, you know, improve the world. Uh, Rhonda, but yeah, I think one of the things, the way I see this, it's so funny, like, because I, because I, every time I hear Noah and, and the awesome work that they're doing and the important work, right, it's, it's, it's like, I, I almost see it as the entree, right? And then there's the appetizers that you can you can have for like lower cost that are like kind of like the the in between because some of the work we've done is it's absolutely like Ilan was saying, a little bit low risk interventions, right? Don't require that same level of of um, evidence and rigor. I mean, if you think about it, if you're just replacing a brochure that's already being used for mental health or, or or reproductive health or something, I mean, that is if that is where the bar is set, then you can actually do something relatively low cost. Um, and and the way we've brought the cost of development down is actually engaging developers in in LMICs, right? Because I mean, there's a lot of high quality talent. Um, it does take a very long outsourcing is not an easy thing to do. And I mean, we found this this whole um, medium where it's not really outsourced. Our entire studio is in is in Pakistan. And that's kind of where we we bring the cost of development down. 
but there are trade-offs, right? I mean, if you're building for the low-end $20 smartphone, you may not be able to be connected to the internet, which means it's not going to send data back to you until the device is connected to the internet. So there are a lot of trade-offs that you go through on production quality, on on um, on connectivity, on how big you can make it. But I still think that it's that in between. I don't think it's a binary. Um, decision. I don't think it's like either or, or nothing. And I do think that there's some low hanging fruits. And that's kind of that that space that we operate in is while we're waiting for the trials to happen. And while we're waiting for all that really important and really cool stuff to happen, can we do some of these things in the middle that are that are a little bit lower hanging fruits and have your appetizer while, while you wait for the entree? <laughs> No, you know, and the last thing I'll say, um, you know, because I know I, I want to be respectful of your time today, too, um, um, and everyone here is that um, I spent eight years at FDA before I moved to NIH. And um, what Ilan, what you were saying is true, um, you know, it is, and, and certainly what you echoed, Noah, is that, you know, it is very expensive, but everyone starts somewhere. And there's certainly the FDA approved track, which is fantastic. Takes a long time, lots, lots of money, um, and you know the agency for a device has to think about whether or not you know you have to make a case for why your device would go down a particular pathway. So it's not just you submit it; you have to make a case for it, and then work with the FDA early on um, to move a particular type of product development forward. And then there's the wellness path, and the wellness path is not the path less, path less traveled, it's the path most often traveled. And so it, it includes and incorporates this low-hanging fruit, um, which is incredibly enriching as you're building iteratively um, toward um, mental health research capacity in an LMIC, and certainly building a mental health research infrastructure in an LMIC, but also beyond that, as you are engaging de device development, but also running randomized controlled trials um, and getting um, NIH or NSF or other types of funding. So there's other pathways, and, it, and I agree with you, Miriam. It's not just you know black and white. There's a lot of gray in between, um, but um, and there are a lot of great work that needs to be done. So I just um, want to thank. Um, I'm just sending. Want to thank Raul and Tanya. You know so much for your help today with this tech issue, and you know want to thank each and every one of you. Noah, Mariam, Elan, Matt. I know you're in here in spirit right now because I don't see you online. But I just want to thank you all, and I want to thank everyone in the audience for coming and spending time with us today as we discuss this. And um, you know, looking forward to interacting in the future. And this has been really wonderful. Um, thank you so much again. Does this um, work as a closeout, or did you have any closing? Yeah, <laughs> I just want to thank you, Rhonda, as well for for being tenacious and working your way back in. Uh, really great to have you join us again. Um, y'all are awesome, and I will um, follow up with you all um, after this. Um, and um, just really appreciate your taking the time today. So, looking forward to um, our next adventures together and apart, and hearing about it all. Peace to you and peace to the Thank audience. Thank you, Rhonda. Thanks, Noah. Thanks, Miriam. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. We're signing off.